Rule 3. Parties to civil actions. Q. Who may be parties in a civil action? Only natural or juridical persons or entities authorized by law may be parties in a civil action. Q. Give examples of entities authorized by law to be parties in a civil action. 1. State of a deceased person. Example, Nassarena v. Court of Appeals, 343 Scra 637. Number 2. A registered labor union. 3. An entity without juridical personality sued as a defendant. Q. The Santos Subdivision Homeowners Association, or SSHA, filed a suit against the petitioner seeking to compel her to provide an open space for Santos Subdivision. The records are bereft of any showing that SSHA is an association duly organized under Philippine law. The petitioner filed a motion to dismiss with the HLURB on the ground of lack of legal personality of SSHA to sue. The HLRB denied the motion to dismiss, treating the action as a suit by all the parties who signed the verified complaint. Should the HLRB have dismissed the complaint? The answer is yes. Article 44 of the Civil Code enumerates the various classes of juridical persons. Under said article, an association is considered a juridical person if the law grants it a personality separate and distinct from that of its members. ASIS HA was not duly organized under Philippine law, hence for failing to show that it is a juridical entity endowed with law with capacity to bring suits in its own name, SSHA is devoid of any legal capacity whatsoever to institute any action. Under Section 1, Rule 3, only natural or juridical persons or entities authorized by law may be parties in a civil action, nor it is proper for the HLRB to treat the complaint as a suit by the signing, as a, as the signing members. The members cannot represent their association without valid legal authority. Tuanis v. Santos Subdivision Homeowners Association, GR 149417, June 2004. Q. In October 2012, Petitioners Association of Flood Victims in Jaime Aguilar Hernandez, or Hernandez filed with the Supreme Court a special civil action for certiorari in or mandamus under Rule 65. Petitioners assert that the Comelec committed grave abuse of discretion when it issued Minute Resolution No. 120859 confirming the reallocation of seats in the party list system. In their petition, it is stated that Petitioner Association of Flood Victims is a non-profit and a non-partisan organization in the process of formal incorporation. The primary purpose of which is for the benefit of the common or general interest of many flood victims who are so numerous that it is impracticable to join all as parties, and that Petitioner Hernandez is a taxpayer and the lead governor or convener of the Association of Flood Victims. Do petitioners have the legal capacity to sue in this case? The answer is no. Clearly, Petitioner Association of Flood Victims, which is still in the process of incorporation, cannot be considered a juridical person or an entity authorized by law, which can be a party to a civil action. Petitioner Association of Flood Victims is an in unincorporated association not endowed with a distinct personality of its own. An incorporated association, in the absence of an enabling law, has no juridical personality and thus cannot sue in the name of the association. Such an incorporated association is not a legal entity distinct from its members. If an association like Petitioner Association of Flood Victims has no juridical personality, then all members of the association must be made parties in the civil action. In this case, other than his bare allegation that he is the lead convener of the Association of Flood Victims, 
Petitioner Hernandez showed no proof that he was authorized by said association. Aside from Petitioner Hernandez, no other member was made signatory to the petition. Only Petitioner Hernandez signed the verification and sworn certification against form shopping, stating that he caused the preparation of the petition. There was no accompanying document showing that the other members of the Association of Flood Victims authorized Petitioner Hernandez to represent them and the association in the petition. Association of Flood Victims v. Comelec, August 5, 2014. Q. A petition for certiorari was filed with the Supreme Court. It was brought in the name of Resident Marine Mammals of the Protected Seascape Tanon Strait, joined in and represented by human beings Gloria and Intenzo Ramos and Rosalisa Esma Osorio in their capacity as stewards of God's creations. The suit was brought against the DNR Secretary and Japan Petroleum Exploration Company Limited and sought to stop petroleum exploration activities in the Tanon Strait on the ground that this would cause environmental damage to the Tanon Strait and damage the ocean life therein. The respondents filed an answer raising the affirmative defense of failure to state a cause of action. The respondents argue that animals cannot be real parties in interest. May animals be real parties in interest? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Our laws provide that only natural or juridical persons or entities authorized by law may be parties in a civil action. However, the petition should not be dismissed on this ground. The need to give the resident marine mammals legal standing has been eliminated by our rules of procedure for environment, environmental cases, which allow any Filipino citizen as a steward of nature to bring a suit to enforce our environmental laws. It is worth noting here that the stewards are joined as real parties in the petition and not just in representation of the mammals. The stewards, Ramos and Esmo Osorio, having shown in their petition that there may be possible violation of laws concerning the habitat of the resident marine mammals, are therefore declared to possess the legal standing to file this petition by virtue of our environmental laws, allowing the bringing of citizen suits. Resident Marine Mammals of Tanon Strait versus Reyes. Q. If the plaintiff is not a natural or juridical person or an entity authorized by law to be a party, what is the ground of dismissal? That the plaintiff has no legal capacity to sue? That is the ground. Section 1, Rule 16. C. Duenas versus Santos Subdivision Homeowners Association or Association of Flood Victims versus Comelec. In whose name must be action or in whose name must an action be prosecuted or defended? Unless otherwise authorized by law or these rules, every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest. Section 2, Rule 3. What is the reason for the rule that every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest? The reason for the rule is that if a person does not stand to benefit or lose by the judgment, it would be a waste of time for the court to try the case. Does the rule require that a civil action be prosecuted by the real party in interest? No. What Section 2, Rule 3 requires is that a civil action be prosecuted in the name of, but not necessarily by the real party in interest. Hence, an action is allowed to be prosecuted or defended by a representative or someone acting in a fiduciary capacity, but the beneficiary shall be included in the title of the case and shall be deemed to be the real party in interest. Q. Who is a party or who is a real party in interest? The party who stands to be benefited or injured by the judgment in the suit or entitled to the avails of the suit. What is the importance of knowing the definition of a real party in interest? It is important since the rules of court provide that every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest unless otherwise authorized by law or the rules of court. 
If an action is prosecuted or defended in the name of someone who is not the real party in interest, what is the remedy of the defendant? The defendant may file an answer raising the affirmative defense of failure to state a cause of action. Florence D. Ricolato Remedial Law, Compendium, number page 76, 7th uh, edition, 3rd printing. Note that the ground is lack of legal capacity to sue. Q. Isagani drove the car of his father, Pedro, and left it in the parking area of the Fairview Motel where he was a guest. Isagani entrusted the key of the car to a security guard hired by the prime resort company, the owner or operator of the motel. Emilio, pretending to be the brother of Isagani, got the key from the security guard and drove away with the car. The car was never recovered. Later, Pedro sued prime resorts for the value of the car up to vehicle plus damages. Prime resorts sets up the defense that Pedro has no interest in that case. Hence, has no cause of action, as he was not the guest of the motel, but his son is a gunny. Is the defense tenable? The defense that Pedro has no interest in the case is not tenable. Under Section 2, Rule 3, a real party in interest is the party who stands to be benefited by the judgment in the suit or the party entitled to the avails of the suit. Here, Pedro owns the car, thus it is clear that he stands to be benefited by the judgment or that he is entitled to the avails of the suit. Being the real party in interest, the objection that he is he has no cause of action will not lie. Dilson Enterprise versus IAC GR seven four nine six four February twenty seven nineteen eighty nine. The argument that it was Isagani not Pedro who was the guest of the motel is without merit. The right of action of Pedro is not based on contract but on law, specifically Article 1999 of the Civil Code, which provides that the hotel keeper is liable for the vehicles which have been placed in the annexes of the hotel. Pedro's right of action could also be based on quasi delhi under Article 2179 of the Civil Code. Q. Miralco supplied electricity to Marvex Industrial Corporation under a service contract. During an inspection in 1985, Miralco allegedly found that its metering devices had been tampered with. Upon failure of Marvex to pay the differential billing, it disconnected Marvex Electrical Service in December 1986. Nordic, the new owner of Marvex, sued Miralco before the RTC for damage damages with prayer for preliminary mandatory injunction. After trial, the RTC dismissed the complaint on the ground, inter alia, that there was also no contractual relationship between Nordic and Miralco, since the service contract was between Miralco and Marvix. Don't be confused, Nordic, Miralco, Miralco, Marvix. Thus, Nordic had no cause of action against Miralco. It is correct to hold that Nordic had no cause of action against Morocco? Is it correct to hold that Nordic had no cause of action against Morocco? The answer is no. The beneficial users of an electric service have a cause of action against this distribution utility. In Manila Electric Company versus Palsus Chua, 637 Phil 80, it was the beneficial users who were awarded damages due to the unjust disconnection of the electric supply. Even though the service contract with Miralco was registered in the name of another person. Further, Miralco is deemed to have knowledge of the fact that Nordic was the beneficial user of Marvic's service contract with Miralco. It admits that the inspections of the metering devices were conducted in the presence of Nordic's maintenance personnel and with the consent of its manager. It further admits that it corresponded with Nordic regarding the differential billing and entertain Nordic's demand for an explanation on the finding of tampering and the recomputation of the amount to be paid by Nordic. Clearly, Miralco knew that it was dealing with Nordic as the beneficial user of the electricity supply. Manila Electric Company versus Nordic fills 18 April 2018. Q. Respondents filed a complaint for nullification of sale and damages against the petitioner 
The respondents allege that they are the grandchildren and successor in interest of Urian and that an imposter sold Urian's land to the petitioner. The RTC rendered summary judgment dismissing the complaint since the respondents being the grandchildren are not the real party's interest as they have no successional rights. On appeal, the CA upheld the RTC's finding that the respondents are not real parties in interest, but it also nullified the deed of sale to petitioner on the ground that Udian's signature was forged. Are the respondents real parties in interest? Letter B. Was it proper for the CAA to render judgment nullifying the deed of sale? Answer to letter A. No, the respondents are not real parties in interest. As grandchildren, they have no successional rights to the estate of Udian unless by virtue of the right of representation. Since the respondents did not show that their mother predeceased Udian, they have no successional rights. Letter B. No. Having established that respondents are not the real parties in interest to the instant suit, the proper course of action was for the CA to merely affirm the RTC's dismissal of their complaint. It therefore erred in proceeding to resolve the other substantive issues on the case and granting one of the principal reliefs sought by the respondents, which is the declaration of the nullity of the question deed of absolute sale. Ang versus Pakunio, July 8, 2015. Q. The Saludo Agpalo Fernandez and Aquino Law Office, or SAFA Law Office, entered into a lease contract with the Philippine National Bank. Subsequently, SAFA Law Office vacated the premises, but there were disputes between it and PNB as to the amount of rentals in arrears. PNB subsequently sent a demand letter to SAFA Law Office demanding payment of its rental obligations in the amount of $25 million. In 2006, Attorney Saludo, in his capacity as managing partner of Safa Law Office, filed a complaint for accounting and or recomputation of unpaid rentals and damages against PNB in relation to the lease contract. May Attorney Saludo be ordered to amend his complaint to include Safa Law Office as plaintiff? The answer is yes. The lease contract was entered into between Safa Law Office and PNB. Hence, SAFA Law Office is the real party in interest. A juridical entity such as a partnership may bring a suit. Section 2, Rule 3 requires that every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest. As the one primarily affected by the outcome of the suit, SAFA Law Office should have filed the complaint with the RTC and should be made to respond to any counterclaims that may be brought in the course of the proceeding. Saludo versus PNB, 20 August 2018. Q. Distinguish between a real party in interest and one having local standing or legal, legal standing. A real party in interest is the party who stands to be benefited or injured by the judgment in the suit, unless otherwise authorized by the law or by the rules of court. Every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest. A party with locus standi or legal standing is one with a personal and substantial interest in a case such that the party has sustained or will sustain direct injury as a result of the governmental act that is being challenged. The gist of the question on standing is whether a party alleges such personal stake in the outcome of the controversy as to assure that concrete adverseness which sharpens the presentation of issues as well as to foster judicial self-restraint. Galicto versus Aquino, February 28, 2012. The question of whether one is a real party in interest turns on the narrow question of whether or not he will be benefited or injured by the judgment in the suit, while the question of locus standi requires an analysis of broader policy concerns. This is why the rule on locus standi may be relaxed where the case is one of transcendental importance or transcendental importance or of paramount public interest. Q. 
Kilospine versus Morato. Q, what is the exception to the rule that every action must be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest? Representative parties under Section 3, Rule 3, an action is allowed to be prosecuted or defended by a representative or someone acting in a fiduciary capacity, provided that the beneficiary shall be included in the title of the case and shall be deemed to be the real party in interest. Give examples of representative parties. Gate, trustee of an express trust, guardian, executor or administrator, party authorized by law or the rules of court. Give an example of a party authorized by law or the rules of court to sue even if he is not the real party in interest. In execution, the court may authorize the judgment obligee to bring an action against a person alleged to have property of the judgment obligor or to be indebted to him. When such person claims an adverse interest in the property or denies the debt, See Lorenzo Reglado Remedial Law Compendium. In this case, the judgment obligee must include in the title the name of the judgment obligor who is deemed to be the real party in interest. A complaint entitled A as attorney in fact for ex plaintiff versus B defendant was filed to recover a car in the possession of B. A's power of attorney expressly authorized him A to sue for the recovery of the car. B files a motion to dismiss the complaint for lack of capacity to sue. Decide the motion. The motion to dismiss should be denied. The ground of the motion to dismiss is erroneous. There is nothing in the problem to be to indicate that A has no legal capacity to sue. The ground that B may have been thinking of is failure to state a cause of action and the argument that A as attorney in fact is not the real party in interest. However, if the ground of the motion to dismiss is failure to state of cause of action, the motion would still be denied. Under Section 3, Rule 3, a representative may be a party, provided that the beneficiary is included in the title of the case. In such a case, even if the suit is brought in the name of the representative, the beneficiary is deemed to be the real party in interest. Here, although the suit was brought in the name of the agent, the beneficiary of Principal X was included in the title of the case. Hence, X is deemed to be the party or the real party in interest and the objection that suit was not in the name of the real party in interest will not lie. The ruling in the case of Arroyo versus Granada, 18 Phil, 484, is no longer a good case law because of Section 3, Rule 3 of the 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure. Plaintiff brought an action for reconveyance over a parcel of land. He brought the action not against the registered owner, Emmanuel, but against his mother, Carmencita. Plaintiff's contention was that Carmencita was the attorney, in fact, of Emmanuel. May the action be dismissed? Yes. The action for reconveyance should have been brought against the registered owner, Emmanuel, and not his mother, Carmencita. The plaintiffs justified the filing of the action against Carmencita on the ground that she was the attorney in fact of Emmanuel. Even assuming that Carmencita was Emmanuel's attorney in fact, the real party in interest was still Emmanuel, who should have been implicated in the complaint pursuant to Section 3, Rule 3. Hence, the action failed to state a cause of action and must be dismissed. Q. A city mayor signed contract in behalf of the city without the prior authorization of the city council as required by the local government code. Do the members of the city council have standing to file a case for the nullification of the contract? Yes. The real party in interest which may file a case questioning the validity of a contract entered into by the city mayor, who is alleged to have authority to do so, is the city itself. It is the local government unit which stands to be injured or benefited by any judgment that may be made in this case. The city councillors, as representatives of the city, 
have the standing to file the case. Lao versus Kagan the Oro City, 13 September 2017. Give an exception to the rule requiring the joinder of the beneficiary. An agent acting is in, in his own name and for the benefit of an undisclosed principal may sue or be sued without joining the principal, except when the contract involves things belonging to the principal. The reason for this rule is that if an agent acts in his own name, the principal has no right of action against the person with whom the agent has contracted, neither have such persons against the principal. In such case, the agent is the one only directly bound in favor of the person with whom he contracted, except when the contract involves things belonging to the principal. Q. Vigent Incorporated bought airplane tickets from Morningstar Traveling Tours Incorporated. The tickets that Vigent bought were in the name of the airplane passengers and paid for with their money. Vigent, in its own name, filed the suit against Morningstar for the refund of unused airplane tickets. Morningstar filed an answer raising the affirmative defense of failure to state a cause of action, arguing that Vigent is not the real party in interest. Vigent argued that it could sue as a representative party pursuant to Section 3, Rule 3. Should the affirmative defense be granted? Yes. Under Section 3, Rule 3, the representative must indicate the name of the beneficiary. Here, the airplane passengers who are deemed to be the real parties in interest. This was not done by Vigent since it sued under its own name. Nor may Vigent invoke the last sentence of Section 3, Rule 3, which provides that an agent acting in his own name and for the benefit of an undisclosed principal may sue without joining the principal. Here, Vigent disclosed its principles. In fact, the airplane tickets were in the name of the airplane passengers. Vigent versus Morning, Morning Star Traveling Tours. Section 4. Spouses as Parties. Rule 3, Section 4. Spouses as Parties. What are the rules regarding spouses as parties to a suit? Section 4, Rule 3, states that husband and wife shall sue or be sued jointly, except as provided by law. This provision does not tell us much as it simply begs the question of what the law provides. If one spouse is suing as plaintiff, the other spouse need not be joined even if the suit relates to community or conjugal property. This is because the spouses are joint administrators of the community or conjugal property, Article 96 and 124 of the Family Code, and the bringing of a suit is but an act of administration. If a spouse is being sued, the other spouse should be joined if the suit could result in liability being incurred by the absolute community or the conjugal property. If the suit would only result in the separate liability of a spouse, the other spouse should not be joined. The liabilities of the absolute community and the conjugal partnership are found in Articles 94, 121 of the Family Code. Husband and wife lent money to defendants' spouses A and B. A and B did not pay the loan. Husband alone filed a suit to collect the loan against A and B. A and B filed a motion to dismiss on the ground that wife was not pleaded as a co-plaintiff in the vi violation of Section 4, Rule 3. Should the motion to dismiss be granted? The answer is no. In an action to recover a sum of money, the failure to join the other spouse is not a jurisdictional defect. The non-joinder of a spouse does not warrant dismissal as it is merely a formal requirement which may be cured by amendment. Karandang v. Ears of the Guzman, GR 160-347, June, or I'm sorry, November 29, 2006. QD, wife, and E, husband, were married in 1990. E works as an employee in a private company abroad. In 1995, D, without E's knowledge, borrowed money from C to put up a drugstore 
the income of which was intended to defray the household expenses. The drugstore, however, incurred only losses and eventually went under. See Sue's DNA to recover the death. Should be, should the absolute community be liable for these debts? Answer is no. Under Article 94, Number 3 of the Family Code, debts contracted by either spouse without the consent of the other shall only be a liability of the absolute communi community to the extent that the family may have been benefited. Actual benefit to the family must be proved. Here, since the drugstore incurred only losses, no benefit was acquired by the absolute community. It does not matter that the income of the drugstore was intended to benefit the family. What matters is the actual benefit. Would your answer be the same if D was the designated administrator or spouse? No. In that case, the absolute community would be liable. The fact that the debt was contracted for the benefit of the community, even if no actual benefit resulted, would suffice to hold liable the absolute community. Article 94, Number 2, Family Code. The Philippine Blooming Corporation obtained a 50 million loan from Ayala Investment. A security for the loan, the executive vice president of PBM, Alfredo Ching, executed a suretyship agreement binding himself solidarily in favor of Ayala Investment. Alfredo Ching was the designated administrator spouse of the absolute community. PBM defaulted on the loan, so Ayala Investment sued PBM and Ching. A final executory judgment was rendered in favor of Ayala Investment, and it sought to levy on the conjugal properties of the spouses Ching. May the sheriff levy on the absolute community property? The answer is no. The sheriff may not levy on the absolute community properties. Under Article 94, Number 2 of the Family Code, the absolute community of property shall be liable for debts or debts contracted during the marriage by the designated administrator or spouse for the benefit of the community. Here, when the husband entered into a suretyship agreement to secure the debt of a third person, he does not thereby contract a debt or obligation for the benefit of the community since the one benefited for the loan was PBM, not the absolute community. Hence, the absolute community of the spouse's Ching is not liable for the debt of Ching, and the sheriff may not levy upon the community properties. Ayala Investment and Development Corporation versus CA. Would your answer be the same if it was proved by Ayala Investment that because of the grant of the loan, the employment of Ching in PBM would be prolonged? that the shares in PBM of the Ching family would rise in value, and that Mr. Ching's prestige in PBM and his career therein would be enhanced? Yes, the benefits contemplated under Article 94, Number 2 of the Family Code must be one directly resulting from the loan, not a mere byproduct or spin-off of the loan itself. Indispensable and Necessary Parties, Section 7 and 8, Rule 3. Who is an indispensable party? An indispensable party is a party in interest without whom no final determination may be had of an action. Who is a necessary party? A necessary party is one who is not indispensable, but who ought to be joined as a party. If complete relief is to be accorded as to those already parties, or for a complete determination or settlement of the claim subject of the action. Distinguish an indispensable party from a necessary party. An indispensable party may be distinguished from a necessary party as follows. 1. As to necessity for final determination, no final determination may be had of an action if an indispensable party is not impleted. While a final determination may be had, of an action even if a necessary party is not impleted. Number two, as to effect of not impleting despite court order. If an indispensable party is not impleted by the plaintiff despite a court order, the court may dismiss the case for failure to prosecute. Section three, rule 17. On the other hand, 
The failure by the plaintiff to implead a necessary party despite court order will not result in the dismissal of the case but simply the waiver of the plaintiff's claim against such necessary party. Section 9, Rule 3. What is the rule regarding an indispensable party? He shall be joined either as plaintiff or as a defendant. Who has the burden to implead or order the impleading of an indispensable party? The burden to implead or to order the impleading of an indispensable party rests on the plaintiff and the trial court, respectively. Barcelona v. Court of Appeals, 354, Bill 250, 275. What is the result if an indispensable party is not impleaded in a suit? The court cannot proceed without their presence. However, the Supreme Court has characterized the failure to implead an indispensable party as a curable error. Hence, the court, instead of dismissing the case, should order the plaintiff to amend his complaint by impleading the indispensable party or allowing the intervention of the indispensable party. These measures may be taken even after rendition of judgment. Pacania Contreras v. Grovilla Water Supply, GR 1689792, December 2013. Amendment or intervention, however, is no longer available if there has already been entry of judgment. In such a case, the judgment would be null and void. Metropolitan Bank and Trust Company versus Alejo. 417 Phil 303. In a declaratory relief proceeding, what is the effect of the failure to include the defendant, a party who would be adversely affected by the declaratory judgment of the court? The non-joinder of persons who claim any interest which may be affected by a declaratory judgment is not a jurisdictional effect or defect, as Section 2, Rule 63 provides that said declaration shall not prejudice their interests. Since the judgment in a declaratory relief case is merely declaratory, not executory, the rule on compulsory joinder of indispensable parties does not apply. What is the test? for determining whether a party is an indispensable party or not. If the party's interests would be directly affected or necessarily prejudiced by the judgment, which would be rendered in the case, then he is an indispensable party. See China Banking Corporation versus Oliver, 319 Scrap 263. Indispensable parties are those who have such interest in the controversy that a final adjudication of the case would certainly affect their rights. Freedom from Debt Coalition versus MWSS, GR 173044. The rule requiring joinder of an indispensable party is thus based on the constitutional right to due process. Give example of indispensable parties. 1. In a partition suit, all the co-owners are indispensable parties. Salvador v. Court of Appeals, GR 109910. In an action for recovery of land against defendant, who is a tenant of a third party who claims ownership, the third party is an indispensable party. In an action for rescission filed by a creditor to annul a fraudulent sale, the vendor is an indispensable party. In an action for annulment of title over a lot, the registered owner of the lot is an indispensable party. Cagatau v. Almonte, GR 174-004. In a petition for certiorari and prohibition filed by the Freedom from Debt Coalition against the MWSS seeking to nullify the rate increases granted by the latter to concessionaires, Manila Water and Manila Water, the concessionaires are indispensable parties. GR 173044. In a petition for certiorari and prohibition of filed by minors against the Secretary of Environment and Natural Resources to set aside the issuances of timber license agreements by the DENR, the timber license agreement holders are indispensable parties. Oposa versus Factoran 224 Squa 972. 
In a petition for cancellation or correction of interest in the civil registry, the local civil register is an indispensable party. Section 3, Rule 108. In an action for cancellation of a loan contract entered into between a municipality and the land bank, filed by a taxpayer against land bank and the municipal officers, the municipality itself is an indispensable party. Land Bank versus Kakayuran. D obtained a car loan from a car dealer, evidenced by a promissory note, and secured by a chattel mortgage over the car executed by D in favor of the car dealer. The note and the chattel mortgage were assigned by the car dealer to BA Finance. D defaulted in the payment of the loan. BA Finance learned later that the car was in the possession of F. BA Finance filed an action for rep living against F to recover the car. D was not impleted. Is D an indispensable party? The answer is yes. In an action for rep living filed by the mortgagee to recover the mortgage chattel in the possession of a third person, the mortgager is an indispensable party even if the chattel is in the possession of a third person. In a chattel mortgage, since the mortgage's right to possession is conditioned upon the fact of default, the inclusion of the debtor or the mortgager is necessary for a full and conclusive determination of the case. See Service Wide Specialists versus Court of Appeals, GR 103301. In the preceding problem, assume that BA Finance filed a abruptly in action against D without impleting F. Is F an indispensable party? The answer is yes. The judgment in the rep living case would directly affect the rights of F, an adverse possessor who is not the mortgager, cannot just be deprived of his possession, let alone be bound by the terms of the chattel mortgage simply because the mortgagee brings an action for rep living. Be a finance corporation versus court of appeals, GR 1029-98. Eduardo Santiago filed with the RTC an action for reconveyance of lot against the GSIS. He died pendentilite and was substituted by his widow Rosario. A judgment was rendered granting the action for reconveyance and a writ of execution was issued as the judgment had become final and executory. In the RTC, Villar filed a motion for substitution claiming that Eduardo had assigned all his rights to him. The RTC issued an order merely noting but Villar's motion without any action. Villar thus filed a Rule 65 petition with the CA to set aside the RTC's order, which merely noted his motion. Villar did not implead Rosario in his Rule 65 petition. The CA granted the petition and ordered the impleading of Villar in substitution of Rosario. The GSIS motion for reconsideration and Rosario's motion to intervene and admit motion for reconsideration was denied. May the CS decision be set aside? The answer is yes. Verily, Rosario is an indispensable party in the petition before the CA as she is the widow of the original party plaintiff Eduardo. The determination of the pro propriety of the action of the trial court in merely noting and not granting Villiers' motion would necessarily affect her interest in the subject matter of litigation as the party plaintiff. The final determination of the case would pry into the right of Rosario as party plaintiff before the lower court who is entitled to the proceeds of the judgment award. In ruling for Villiers' substitution, the right of Rosario as to the proceeds of the judgment award was thwarted as the CA effectively ordered that the proceeds pertaining to Rosario be awarded instead to Villiers. Hence, failure to implead the Rosario as an indispensable party rendered all the proceedings before the CA null and void for want of authority to act. Santiago v. Villiers March 6, 2018. Pua filed a complaint for collection of money against Ang and her mother, Dayton. The co-owners of J.D. Grain Center, 
Summons were duly served upon Dato, but not upon Ang, who had absconded. May the case proceed without summons being served upon Ang? The answer is no. Until the summons has been served on Ang, the case cannot proceed, since Ang is an indispensable party to the case, who alleged in his complaint that the respondents are co-owners of J.D. Grain Center. A court must acquire jurisdiction over the person of indispensable parties before it can validly pronounce judgments personal to the parties. The absence of an indispensable party renders all subsequent actions of the court null and void for want of authority to act, not only as to the absent parties, but even as to those present. Summons by publication must be effected against Ang. Pua v. Dato, 26 November 2012. Landowner filed an action for reconveyance of land against the developer Spring Homes, which had transferred by way of an absolute deed of sale the land to the spouse's lumbres. Summons was duly served on the spouse's lumbres, but not on Spring Homes. The trial court dismissed the action on the ground that summons was not served on Spring Homes, which is an indispensable party. Did the trial court correctly dismiss the case? The answer is no. In an action for recovery of possession of land against Spring Homes transfer and spouses Lumbres transfer, the transfer is not an indispensable party. The reason is that having transferred all its interest in the land to the spouses Lumbres, Spring Homes did not stand to be directly affected or necessarily prejudiced by the judgment that may be rendered in the case. Spring Homes versus Tablada. O sold a parcel of land to B. Subsequently, O sold and delivered the same parcel of land to C, who filed with the RTC an application for original registration of the land. The application was granted and an original certificate of title was issued in the name of C, B filed an action for reconveyance against C. Judgment was rendered in favor of B. On appeal, C argued that B should have impleted the seller O, who is an indispensable party. Is C's argument correct? No. C's argument is not correct. The property owners against whom the action for reconveyance is filed are indispensable parties. No relief can be had, and the court cannot render a valid judgment without them. However, the seller of the property is not an indispensable party. The reason is that when the seller has sold and delivered the property to the buyer, he has lost any right of interest over the property. Avoidis versus Poe. Plaintiff filed an action with the RTC for cancellation of title of Pedro Santos. The certificate of title is registered in the name of Pedro Santos, married to Susan Santos. Summons Reserved by publication since Pedro Santos was a non resident. The court ruled in favor of the plaintiff. The son of Susan Santos contends that the judgment is null and void because an indispensable party, Susan Santos, was not impleted in the action for cancellation. Is the son correct? The answer is no. In an action for cancellation of title filed against the registered owner, his wife is not an indispensable party if land is registered as husband, married, wife. In the absence of any showing that the land was acquired during the marriage, the presumption is that the land is the exclusive property of the husband. See Onstot versus Upper Tugpus Neighborhood Association, September 2016. Medical students of St. Luke's College of Medicine perished in a fire in a community clinic wherein they were undergoing medical clerkship. The parents sued St. Luke's for damages after showing that the fire was caused by faulty wiring in the community clinic. The RTC dismissed the complaint on the ground that the municipality of Cabiao, which owned the community clinic and had a memorandum of intent with St. Luke's, for the construction and operation of the community clinic was not impleted. The RTC held that the municipality was an indispensable party without whom no final determination can be had of the action. 
Was the dismissal correct? The answer is no. The municipality is not an indispensable party. Under Section 7, Rule 3, in order to be an indispensable party, the party should be one without whom no final determination can be had of an action. Here, the parents' premise St. Luke's liability and its contractual obligation to their students, and certainly complete relief and a final judgment can be arrived at by weighing the claims and defenses of the parents and St. Luke's without need of evaluating the claims and defenses of the municipality of Cabiao. If at all, the municipality of Cabiao is a necessary party whose non-inclusion in the case at bar shall not prevent the court from proceeding with the action. Saints Luke's College of Medicine v. Perez, 28 September 2016. House Talk, Incorporated, or HTI, a seller, entered into a contract to sell CTS over a realty in favor of respondent spouses. HTI later assigned its rights under the CTS to Philippine Veterans Bank. PVB. Under the deed of assignment, the assignee acquired all the rights of the assigner except for legal title over the properties which was retained by HTI. PBV or PVB served a notarial cancellation of the CTS upon the respondents for failure to pay the consideration under the CTS. PVB then filed an action for unlawful detainer against the respondents. The MTC ruled in favor of PVB and judgment was affirmed on appeal by the RTC. However, the CA on appeal set aside the decision and remanded the case to the MTC for HTI to be impleted. The CA held that HTI is an indispensable party since it had retained legal title pursuant to the deed of assignment. Is HTI an indispensable party? The answer is no. That HDI retained ownership over the subject property pursuant to the deed of assignment did not mean that it is an indispensable party to the case. An indispensable party is one who has an interest in the subject matter of the controversy which is inseparable from the interests of the other parties and that a final adjudication cannot be made without affecting such interests. Here, the only issue in the instant unlawful detainer suit is who between the litigating parties has the better right to possess de facto the subject property. Thus, HDI's interest in the subject property as one holding legal title thereto is completely separable from PVF's right under the CTS, which include the cancellation or rescission of such contract and resultantly the recovery of actual possession of the subject property. Hence, the courts can proceed to determine who between PVB and the respondents have a better right to the possession of a, the subject property and complete relief can be had even without HDI's participation. Philippine Veterans Bank v. Sabado, August 30, 2017. In an action for cancellation of a transfer certificate of title, is the Register of Deeds an indispensable party? The answer is no. The Register of Deeds is merely a nominal party who does not need to participate in the proceedings to adjudicate the rights of the plaintiff and defendant. The failure to plead the Registry of Deeds is not fatal to the case. De Leon v. Chua Give examples of necessary parties. 1. A joint obligor in a joint obligation. Number 2. A transfer pendentilite. Section 19, Rule 3. The failure to plead and or include the transfer pendentilite would not affect the validity of the judgment. Number three, in an action to foreclose a real estate mortgage, the junior mortgages or lien holders are necessary parties. In a case of a co-owned property and one of the co-owners files an ejectment suit, the other co-owners are necessary parties in so far as the filing of the complaint is concerned. Thus, there is no need for the other co-owners to join the plaintiff. Manuel versus Moran, Comments on the Rules of Court. 
page 189. A and B brought an action to annul a deed of sale over a piece of land and to recover the land from D, in whose favor the deed was executed by X, father of A and B, already deceased. On the ground that the deed of sale was forged, in his answer, D denied that the signature of X was forged. Finding that the signature of X was forged, the court ordered the deed of sale annulled and the land returned to A and B. On appeal, D raised the question that the decision is null and void because the land in question is owned in common by succession by A, B, Y, and Z as their brothers, who, however, did not join in the action as plaintiffs. Hence, the action was not brought by all the parties in interest, and there was none joinder of indispensable parties, for which reason the action should have been dismissed. May the contention of D be sustained. The reason is no. The contention of D may not be sustained. In an action to recover co-owned property, one co-owner alone may bring the action pursuant to Article 487 of the Civil Code which provides that any one of the co-owners may bring an action for ejectment. The Supreme Court has held that Article 487 applies as well to an action publicana or publishana and to an action revé indicatoria. One co-owner may suffice to file the suit since it is presumed to have been filed for the benefit of all co-owners. Y and Z are merely necessary parties, and thus the judgment of the court is valid. Moreover, non-joinder of party is not a ground for dismissal. Quirino and Milagros are co-owners of a credit extended to the spouse's carandang. Quirino sued the spouse's carandang. The spouse's carandang filed a motion to dismiss on the ground that an indispensable party, who is Milagros, was not impleted as a co-plaintiff. The spouses Karandang contend that a co-owner is an indispensable party. Should the motion to dismiss be granted? No. In an action to recover co-owned property, one co-owner alone may bring the action pursuant to Article 487 of the Civil Code, which provides that any one of the co-owners may bring an action for ejectment. The Supreme Court stated that Article 487 applies to actions to recover personal property. One co-owner may suffice to file the action for the suit since it is presumed to have been filed for the benefit of all co-owners. Kandang v. Ears of the Guzman, GR 160347. Milagros is merely a necessary party. Moreover, the joinder of party is not a ground for dismissal. D, E, and F are solidarily indebted to P for 9,000 or 9 million. P files a collection case against D only. Are E and F indispensable parties? The answer is no. In a solidary obligation, a creditor may sue all, several, or just one of the solidary debtors. Cereso versus Tuazon, GR141538. In an action to foreclose a real estate mortgage, is the junior mortgagee an indispensable party? Answer is no. He is merely a necessary party. The mortgage may be foreclosed without impleting him and without prejudice to his equity of redemption. Is a solidary co-debtor a necessary party? No, because complete relief is available as to one co-debtor. Ceres over Sistuazan. Is a joint debtor a necessary party? Yes, a creditor may sue one joint debtor for his share, although necessarily that would not afford complete relief to him. Hey, please forgive the blunders. Um, looks like we have more cases, samples, before going to Rule 4. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and let's study together. Drop your comments too, for inspiration. Thanks.